Chapter 5 of The Boy at the Back of the Class The Refugee Kid When I got home that night, I stayed up for as long as I could and waited for Mum to come back from work. It's always half past nine by the time she gets in on Mondays because Mondays are late nights at the library. I'm supposed to be in bed by then or she gets cross, but I didn't mind being told off. Not if it meant I could find out what had made the new boy a refugee kid and why Mrs Grimsby thought they caused trouble and took people's jobs all the time. On the bus home, Michael said refugee kids came from big tents in the desert, but then Josie said that no one was allowed to live in tents in England except for when they were going on a camping trip because it was against the law. And Tom said he'd heard of refugees on the television but couldn't remember why they were running away and that England didn't have any deserts with lots of tents in anyway. It was all very confusing, but I knew my mum would know because she works in the library and libraries have books about everything. My mum is amazing and the most cleverest person I know, even cleverer than Mrs Khan. She works two jobs. She's a librarian during the week and on Saturdays she's a carer. She looks after people who can't eat or walk or remember things properly anymore and are too sick to live on their own. Because mum has to work all the time, I don't get to see her lots except on Sundays. Sundays are our special adventure days. We used to have them all the time with my dad. Whenever he had a day off, he would wake us up early, pack a lunch and we'd set off in the car for an adventure, usually to the seaside or a safari park, or if the weather was cold, for bowling or a movie. We can't really afford to do any of those things now because when I was six years old, my dad died in a car crash. Sometimes I worry that I'm forgetting him even though I miss him every day. But when I think hard and dive right down into the deepest part of my brain, he's still there. He was the funniest dad anyone could ever have. He used to be a carpenter and loved to build things out of whatever he could find. This is what my dad looks like in my memory. He always talked a lot more than mum and loved to make up stories. But more than anything, he loved listening to music. He had a huge music collection and was always fixing the old fashioned record player my grandfather had bought him for his 13th birthday. He taught me how to play the big black discs on it and how to polish the large golden sound horn properly. Mum was gonna sell it last year to help pay the bills because apparently the older something is, the more money it's worth. Only for things, that is, not people. But luckily, my Uncle Lenny made her give it to me instead. Uncle Lenny is my mum's brother and is the best uncle in the world. Even though he's married to my Aunt Christina, who I really don't like. And has a son called Jacob who likes breaking things. He tries to visit us at least once a week, usually on his own. He's always asking me if there's anything I need. I love that about him. And I'll always love him for helping me keep Dad's record player. It's in my room now, but I never play music on it unless Mum's out of the house. She doesn't like me using it very much. I think it reminds her of when my Dad used to dance around with her after he'd made a chair or a table he was proud of. It makes her too sad. I've been playing one of my dad's favourite old records to stop myself falling asleep when I suddenly heard my mum's key in the door. You can always tell when it's her key in the door and not my uncle Lenny's because it jangles the loudest. I quickly turned the song off and ran into the living room. Well, hello there, munchkin, said mum. I could tell she was surprised to see me because her eyebrows had jumped and disappeared into her hair. What are you doing up so late? I can't sleep, I said. Oh, she said, giving me a hug. She looked at me with a frown and touched my forehead. She always touches my forehead when she's worried about me. You're not feeling ill, are you? I shook my head. Have you had your supper? I nodded. I usually have a tin of soup and a bread roll for supper on the nights Mum can't make it home in time for dinner. Mrs Abby from next door comes and helps me make it when she knows I'm going to be on my own. She's old and has trouble walking, but... Sometimes she makes me fish fingers if she's feeling well. My favourite soup is tomato soup because it reminds me of tomato ketchup. Ketchup is one of my most favourite things to eat in the whole wide world. You can add a dollop of ketchup to any dish that's not a dessert. 
and I'll bet you my pocket money it will make that dish taste instantly better. It's third on my list of top foods after chocolate and then ice cream that comes in a cone from an ice cream van. Well then, said Mum as she puts her bags down, let's see if a little hot chocolate doesn't put you to rights. Come and keep me company while I have some tea. I'm not that hungry today. I followed Mum into the kitchen, watched her get out the cocoa jar and switch on the kettle. And then before I knew it, I asked, Mum, what's a refugee kid? I didn't really mean to blurt it out like that, but sometimes my mouth does things my brain isn't ready for. Mum stopped what she was doing and stared at me. A refugee kid? She asked with a frown on her face. Where did you hear those words? At school, I said, someone called the new boy in our class refugee kid. You've got a new boy in your class? I nodded. And Mrs Khan didn't tell you anything about him? I shook my head. Only that he's called Ahmet and he's never been to London before. I've been trying to make friends with him, but he doesn't talk to anyone, so I can't tell if he wants to be friends back. I see. Mum felt silent. She poured the milk into the milk pan and waited for it to heat up. I knew she was thinking about something serious because she was rubbing her chin a lot. Mum only rubs her chin when she is about to say something serious. Mum, I whispered. But Mum stayed silent, which made me start to worry. Mum usually answers my questions right away. Maybe what Mr Brown had called the new boy wasn't a nice thing to call him at all. While I waited for my hot chocolate, I went and sat down in my chair and looked out of the window. Our flat isn't very big, but we have a small table near the window with four chairs round it. I always sit in the chair next to the fridge because I like being able to open the fridge door without getting up. It's like looking into an extra room in the house, but one that's filled with food instead. Whenever I go to Uncle Lenny's house, I always look in his fridge because his one is so big it almost touches the kitchen ceiling. If he had to, my Uncle Lenny could live in his fridge. He'd have to take out all the shelves and things, but he could definitely live in it, standing up if he wanted to. I think it's good to have a fridge that's big enough to stand in. It means you'll never run out of food like we do sometimes. And if you do, you can go and have a wander in it. When Mum had finished making the hot chocolate and her tea, she sat down in her chair, which is opposite mine, and took out two lumps of sugar from the sugar jar. Keeping them balanced on a spoon, she slowly swirled them into the tea in little circles. We both watched them as they got smaller and smaller until they disappeared. Mum, can you tell me then, what's a refugee kid? I mean, where do they come from? Mum gave me a look. She has at least 20 different looks that give me a secret message and I know what they all mean. This one meant, stop asking me. Then she said, do you remember those lifeboats on the telly darling? The ones with lots of people squeezed into them? The ones that you were asking about? I nodded. It had been the middle of the summer holidays. Mum and I were in the sitting room. She was doing a crossword and I'd been colouring in some drawings I'd done and the news was on in the background. The TV screen had suddenly changed from a woman reporter standing on a beach to a video of lots of people in boats in the middle of an ocean, all looking scared. I'd felt sorry for them and asked Mum what was going on. Do you remember what I said? Asked Mum. Um, you said that they were trying to find somewhere new to live because their home wasn't nice to live in anymore. Exactly. They were what people call refugees. And children, like the new boy in your class, are called refugee kids because they've had to leave their homes and travel very far to find a new home to live in. Do you mean like Dina? I asked, wondering if Dina was going to be called a refugee kid in her new school too. She'd moved to Wales because her mum and dad couldn't find a house in London. No, not exactly, she said. Dina's mum and dad wanted to move. They had a choice. And they wanted to live in a much bigger, nicer house than the one they had already. Refugee children are forced to run away because bad people have made it impossible for them to stay. 
Those bad people drop bombs onto their houses and destroy all the beautiful parts of their cities. And the places where the refugees used to live have become so horrible and scary, they can't live in them anymore. So they walk for miles and miles and get into boats to travel to countries they've never been to before and go to strange places they don't know, just so they can find somewhere that's safe enough to live in again. Oh, I said quietly. I wondered what the refugees had done to make the bad people so angry. Last year, two year ones in school had tripped over Brendan the bully to get back at him for chasing them, which made him so angry that he smashed open their lunch boxes and stomped on all their food. What did the refugees do to make the bad people want to hurt them? I asked thinking it must have been something really bad to make someone want to drop a bomb on their houses. Mum shook her head. Nothing, darling. The bad people are just much stronger than they are. And they like to feel big and powerful by bullying them. You see, some people think that by taking things away from other people and hurting them, it gives them more power. And the more power they have, the more they want. And the greedier they get. So they go on hurting more and more people till everyone just has to run away. Just like the bullies at school, I said, feeling angry. Well, yeah, I guess it's like that, said Mum. Except the bullies the refugees are running away from are a lot bigger and they're far more horrible. They force people to leave everything they've ever had behind, even the people that they love the most in the world. I thought about the new boy. I felt sorry for him. Maybe he'd been forced to leave behind lots of things that he loved most in the world and that's why he didn't talk to anyone and needed so much seclusion. <clears throat> I tried to think of what I would leave behind if I had to run away from lots of bullies but I couldn't decide. All I know is I could never leave my dad's record player or his favourite hammer. That's in the bottom kitchen drawer. Mum got up and took her mug to the sink. Now, I know you want to make friends with this new boy, but you mustn't be too eager. You'll need lots of time and space first, OK? I nodded, even though I didn't really understand what she meant. If I was the new boy, I'd use up all my time to make as many friends as I could, especially if I'd just run away from bullies that were bigger and more horrible than the bullies in the school. I wondered if I should tell my mum about all the lemon sherbets and white mice and the orange with the smiley face I'd given him. But then she said, the world has never been kind to refugees. She sounded just like she did when she talked about my dad. So even though I wanted to ask at least four more questions, I decided not to say anything else. Now, drink up and off to bed and I'll come and tuck you in in just a few minutes. Mum came and ruffled my hair. She always ruffles my hair when she wants me to think she's happier than she really is. I drank the rest of my hot chocolate just as quickly as I could and I ran to bed. Mum only ever tucks me into bed when she's home early, so this was a real special treat. I love being tucked into bed, even more than I love beating everyone else in a race or scoring a goal. It's the best feeling in the world to be wrapped up all warm and fuzzy in a blanket by someone you love more than anyone else on the planet and who loves you right back. As I lay waiting for mum to come in, I thought about all the things she'd said, about the bombs and the boats and the bad way that people who were so greedy that they made everyone want to run away from them. I had so much to tell Josie and Tom and Michael, especially as I don't think their mums and dads would have told them half as much as mum told me. It's one of the things I love most about mum, she always tries to answer my questions, no matter how tired she is or how hard my questions are. And she always tells me the truth. Michael's parents are always saying, not now, dear, or we'll tell you when you're older. And Josie's mum just keeps telling her that girls are meant to be quiet and not ask so many questions. But my mum never says anything like that to me. I think it's because of all the books she reads. Mum says the best books leave you with more questions than answers. And that's the fun part. You have to try and find the answers for yourself somewhere else. And Dad used to say that the more questions you ask, the more clever you'll be. 
because the only way you'll ever know more than you already do is to ask questions. I think this is the first time in my life that I've ever wanted to be extra, extra clever about anything. Because by the time mum had come to tuck me in for the night, I had a long list of questions in my head that I wanted to ask the new boy. 11 questions. This is what they look like. Number one, where did you have to run away from? Number two, what language do you speak? Number three, who's the woman in the red scarf? Number four, do you have any brothers or sisters? Number five, what did the bullies do to make you want to run away? Number six, did you have to get into a boat like the people on the news? Number seven, what sports do you like best? Number eight, what's your favourite film? Number nine, how far did you have to walk to get away from the bullies? Number 10, do you like it here or do you miss your old house? Number 11, do you have a best friend? My 11 questions would help me know everything I needed to know about the new boy so that I could be his friend. And I was going to find out the answers to every single one of them.